Now, the National Security Council Secretariat has denied claims that national security operatives tortured the modern Ghana journalist detained recently. While the Secretariat in a statement insists that the suspect, Emmanuel Agafor, was never manhandled, neither was he subject to any form of forced physical contact. They indicated that torture and manhandling of suspects are not a part and parcel of the culture and architecture of the Secretariat under the administration of President Nanadu Dankwa Kufuado. While the Secretariat explained it expects a medical examination to be done to present the truth in the matter. While ModernGhana.com's editor Emmanuel Ajafo uh, was detained and a colleague Emmanuel Yeboa uh, Brinchum are uh, to be arraigned before court today. All right, so uh, pretty shortly I'll be going live on Skype to speak to Justice Remsai, who is a lawyer and a law lecturer. I'll be speaking to them shortly on this latest development. Uh, we're also going to be joined by criminologist Dr. Justice Tankebi, who is a criminologist and policing expert. Both gentlemen are live on Skype now. I'll, I will start off with Justice Tankebi. So first of all, uh, assuming without admitting that indeed this gentleman uh, was tortured, as he says, Will this be acceptable under uh, our human rights laws? I think the answer to that question will be no. I believe that our laws do not permit the use of torture. And of course, uh, Ghana has signed up also to international conventions uh, against the use uh, of torture. And indeed, I think recently, a team from the UN uh, visited Ghana precisely to inspect the way that we treat people whose uh, liberties we have restricted for various reasons. So I think the straightforward answer to that is that no, our laws, as I understand them, do not permit the use of torture. And it's probably precisely the reason that the authorities are denying that they have indeed used torture. But of well course... We have to ask ourselves whether when it comes to some of these activities, it's only the question of the illegality of the action that is the issue. Uh, there are other questions to be asked. Is this effective? Is this fair to the individuals involved in terms well, of... Well, Justice, the ultimate aim, you and I know, is often to retrieve information from the suspects. Well, the evidence we have suggests that uh, torture is uh, an ineffective instrument. And indeed, if you look at all the cases where uh, people have been exonerated, uh, one of the factors uh, that led to that exoneration was the use of torture, uh, torture techniques, which produce false confessions, uh, because you are essentially pushing the individual to a point where admitting the offense becomes the easier way out for that individual. So on that front, it is an ineffective tool. I'm yes, glad you talk about this being an ineffective tool. Let me just hop on the following, on the other line uh, to speak to Justice Sremsai, who is a law lecturer at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration. Thank you, Justice, for your time and for joining us also. Is this permissible, human rights abuse and torture, as a means of procuring information from suspects? Is this permissible in the court of law? Uh, thanks so much for having me and good afternoon to your viewers. As my friend... Um, Justice has already said. And as a matter of fact, um, torture, what many people may not know is that torture ranks alongside general um, and all the other serious crimes over which international law places an obligation on every state to not just punish but also to investigate allegations. What this means is that the Republic but also to put mechanisms in place 
to conduct a fair you know, investigations. And that is where some of us are beginning to Well, I'm afraid we're having some difficulties with uh, Justice Holmes' line. Let me just go back to uh, Justice uh, Tenkaba, who is a criminologist. Uh, Mr. Tenkaba, so you're, you're advancing a point on the fact that... I think that's what my colleague was uh, trying to get at. We need mechanisms of accountability, of investigating some of these uh, allegations. And I think one of those issues, reforms that we need, is that once a person comes into contact with security agencies or especially the police for the purposes of interviews or interrogation, we should be having a video recording of every single questioning um, that it's uh, put to that individual and the way that is treated. We should have that transparency. Uh, unfortunately, it appears that once you enter a police station or you enter uh, the premises of some of these security agencies, then the issue of accountability appears to stop at the door. We need to correct that situation. Mm. Uh, just same side, thanks uh, for coming back on the line. Is there a way of verifying the authenticity of the claims by these journalists? Because it's his word against that of the national security. They are saying that they never, under no circumstances, did they uh, torture these journalists. Yes, um, there are indeed ways of verifying. The question, however, is um, do we have the mechanisms of giving a fair and, and a just you know, verification of what the allegation is? And let's not forget, torture has assumed a certain dimension that we do not only talk of torture, but we talk of torture, including other inhuman treatments that persons you know, go through. What it means is that you do not necessarily have to... Uh, torture mechanisms don't necessarily leave traces of harm, physical injury behind as we used to know. Uh, certain things can actually cause more harm and more fear to a person than physical injury. So if we limit ourselves to physical injury, then we'll be talking about medical examination as the National Security Secretary letter indicated. Uh, but wrongly, uh, we need to understand that uh, physical injury is not the only uh, is not is not the only outcome of or the, what we call evidence of torture. There may be other ways of persons suffering torture without living, without having any physical injury. So the point, as my colleague was making, is that the total solution to this is transparency. We should not have a system where people get into police stations or security and uh, intelligence agent offices and then they are blacked out of the world. Whatever happens to them, no one knows, you know. So long as we keep that system in place, then people are going to be suffering this, you know, heinous crime uh, over and over again. And I think that our security and intelligence agencies should uh, start inching towards total transparency of, of, of persons with the suspect of committing crime whenever they have them. Uh, confined. Right, I've got a final question for both of you. Um, earlier, we were under the mistaken belief that these, uh, the officers of these gentlemen were rounded uh, because of a, a, a publication against the National Security uh, Minister. Later, uh, we were told that uh, they had been picked up for uh, cyber crime, uh, alleged hacking of, of, of certain companies, hacking into their systems. Now, assuming without admitting that these allegations are true, is this a matter that should be taken up by national security or BNI, which should, you know, warrant these gentlemen to be detained for at least, you know, a day or two? Um, okay. So, first of all, I think, of course, I do not know um, the seriousness of the uh, offense uh, or the allegation made against these individuals. But I think it raises the question as to how seriously we take our police service in, uh, in our democracy, how critical a role we see them to play, and whether we are consistently undermining the police service, sidelining them, allowing other actors into the space who rather should be relying on the police for the everyday maintenance of law and order in our country. And I think to the extent that 
this is ultimately ended up with the police because the statement says they've been handed over to the to the police for investigation. It raises questions as to why the police were not the ones making the arrest through uh, means that are not as militaristic and gun holding in the way that we have witnessed. So I think, um, in my uh, view, as I've consistently said, I think we need a situation where we prioritize the police in our democracy for the purposes of the maintenance of law and order, and of course, preventing harms to uh, in local communities. And that means right. radical right. reforms in ways that make the police more effective and builds public confidence in them. Right, Justice Tangabe. Uh, quickly, uh, Justice Sra Samsara, you are a lawyer. Uh, just take a quick bite of this question. Yeah, uh, I think, Bright, I think you, you already know that the legal, you know, uh, lawfulness of national security, you know, carrying out uh, these tactical operations has come under serious question even before the, the, the commission of inquiry, the Ayawasu, you know, commission. So for me personally, I, I think the national security secretary has no legal basis to be conducting these uh, tactical operations. Having said that, uh, what we need to, 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 to understand is that Well, I'm afraid uh, we... Processes, whether being done by whether being done by the National Security Secretariat or by the police. Um, one of the key you know, a suspect without giving the person I'm afraid we've got to leave it here. Justice Ram Sai is a uh, lawyer, also a lecturer at the Ghanaian Civil Management and, and Public Administration, and also uh, Justice Tankabe is a criminologist joining us there on Skype. Uh, we're going to stay a while longer on this subject. I've just been joined in studio by the country director of Amnesty International, Robert Akoto Amanfo. Uh, he's also going to uh, take a bit of a bite on this subject. It's our top story for the day. Feel free also to uh, share your views and suggestions with us on this story. Thank you, uh, Robert for your time. So you have taken this matter up quite seriously. Uh, what's your position? Thank you. So our position as um, where um, Justice Sunshine left it is that even if anybody, whatever crime the person commits, the person needs to be given the processes laid down by the Constitution when the person is arrested. That is access to a lawyer. The person should be treated as any other person. Unless the person has resisted arrest, then the person will be given certain um, procedures. But once the person didn't um, resist arrest, the person was there, was able to be arrested, the method that has been prescribed that was used, we think it's wrong and it shouldn't be done. And for you, under the circumstances, his rights were violated? Yes, his rights have been violated, and for, for us, we have advised that um, he should take it up with, to charge because charge has a responsibility of um, investigating certain matters and making the recommendations accordingly. And we are looking up to the, um, um, the media commission to also take up this matter seriously as they've done in other cases. Uh, he's been held for act of uh, cybercrime. That's quite serious. Yes, it's serious, and as I mentioned, whatever crime the person has committed, you don't um, um, you don't infringe on the person's rights. Mm -hmm. um, whatever crime the person has committed, the person, once a person is arrested, the person also has rights notwithstanding what they have done. Mm. So you, you want him to take this matter up to the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice. What are you going to do to support him? What, like, as we've started, one, we are advising um, and, and, and supporting him to go to charge, to mm -hmm. go and report. Our interest is that we think that this is an attack also on media and, and, and freedom. You think so? Once, once the person is a journalist and the person has also made... An Robert, is this not an isolated case? No, this is not an isolated case. Mm. The, the journalist also made his case. Mm. Let's not forget that there are two cases here. And mm. that is why we are quest calling for the need for the investigation mm. so that we know. Because once it is put into the public that it's a matter of journalists mm. who is being arrested for writing a story, mm. and we have the, the, the security saying that it is an issue of um, crime, um, um, crime on the, on, on the internet. We need to get the truth. I, I say isolated because it's just one story we've had. Unless you have, you can cite, cite instances where we've had journalists, uh, you know, rights been trampled upon, then you can make a case for, uh, you of know. Of course. I mean, we have the issue of uh, the, the Joy FM journalist who was beating uh, mercilessly when he went to report the, and went to gig the reports of the case that happened. Mm. We have issues of um, two journalists who were beaten up by um, 
other people, other um, media people at a, a particular event, mm. the security at a particular event. So that is what we are saying, that once these stories keep coming and up... There's a sustained trend. Exactly. There's mm. a need for us to pay attention mm. to that um, issue that is happening. And this can be a case that we can use. As we use the Ayawasu case for vigilantism, we can use a particular case to look at other cases and make sure that it is addressed systematically and sustainably. And it doesn't happen again before we get somebody dies mm. before we get alarmed about these issues. Robert, thank you very much. Robert Amanfo is country director for Amnesty International, also adding their voice to the latest um, arrest um, of uh, the journalist uh, over the weekend.